Uh, good morning, Matt. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Great, great. It's good to hear. Um, I apologize for uh, my absence last week and our discussion. Uh, as I've shared, uh, we're about to begin uh, courses at, at at on campus, and and so I'm you know getting everything uh, together uh, as far as that's concerned, writing syllabi and acclimating to the best of uh, uh, best of uh, possibilities uh, to this uh, digital uh, format. Uh, <laughs> uh, however, new uh, it is for me. I've never taught online before, except for last semester towards the end when we canceled the uh, regular semester. And anyway, uh, that aside, I'm hope you. I'm glad you're doing well. Uh, I'm doing well, relatively speaking, and um, and I welcome everybody. Uh, welcome Hesu for joining us, of course, and and uh, others that have uh, joined us uh, over the. Uh, numerous, numerous episodes that we have uh, taken up as we uh, address uh, the question, the analysis uh, of uh, capital. Uh, any, any, uh, any opening thoughts uh, before we uh, get started, uh, Matt, that you'd like to share uh, before we talk about uh, uh, the restaurant industry? Well, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about this one because uh, this is actually the uh, chapter ten. I believe is actually the the, the the chapter where he says that uh, that capital is a uh, dead labor, which is yeah. yeah, so often quoted. Um, and it's just almost like a it's it's kind of come. I don't want to say throwaway line, but it's it's a very it's a, it's part of a rhetorical flourish because then yeah. he goes on to this whole um like a vampire like sucking yeah. blood and the more labor, it, you yeah. Know, the more the more it feeds the more it desires and, uh, <laughs> and so like that's kind of um i don't know it's it, this is a a a, a theme that has uh, emerged many times in our in yeah. our, dis our discussion you know it's like this concept of capital being dead labor so yeah this is a chapter, so uh, you know i look forward to the discussion yeah. um, certainly the chapter is uh, ripe with um uh, literary uh, uh style uh, I, I enjoy the whole book. Otherwise, of course, I wouldn't be doing this. But, but yes, yeah, certainly, this chapter is 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 notable in in the regard that you that you uh, make. Well, um, where last week we talked about, or I'm sorry, two weeks ago we talked about, um, we talked about agricultural work and the agricultural industry and the exploitation of. Uh, Mexican people, Mexican workers, Chicano and Chicano workers within that uh, larger uh, industrial sector. Um, this week, uh, I'd like to uh, address. I'd like to address urban uh, employment, urban labor, and I'd like to do so uh, in light of the fact that one of the principal channels of employment uh, for Chicano and Chicano people. Uh, one of the principal uh, channels of employment, not just for Latinos and Latinas more generally, but even within the LA metropolitan region, uh, is the what's called the hospitality industry. And so uh, I'd like to shed light on that because I think it's very important uh, uh, to address on, on both historical accounts, you know, uh, historical economy, right? Uh, but then also on account of, frankly, uh, <laughs> the proportion of, of Mexican origin people, Latina and Latino origin people uh, that find themselves in this particular industry. And, and of course, the, the general context and scope of the work that we do uh, as far as, as capital is concerned. And so I'd like to begin with the story that I um, discovered uh, in the LA Times as I was making my way through um, Google and and looking for things to uh, provide some kind of empirical context, and it's a story about uh, restaurant workers in uh, the Korean barbecue restaurant industry. Uh, this is from a from an LA Times article titled um, "Workers Workers Who Make Korean Barbecue Possible Deserve Better," and it's an account of uh, wage theft 
and uh, various forms of exploitation. Some are terrible. Uh, one, one wouldn't think, one who isn't thinking about the people making the dish available to us on you know the restaurant table one wouldn't think that there is literally uh, so much sacrifice blood sweat and tears right that are uh, part and parcel ingredients of the very uh, dish uh, on our on our table uh, your thoughts matt before we get into the summary or before we get into some of the quotes in the article um I loved the quotes. I mean, it's kind of like I'm following. All right. All right. Perfect. Well, what I'd like to do is I'd like to begin, uh, you know, the reporter, what the reporter does is he um, actually goes to this particular uh, uh, Korea, uh, Korea town eatery. I think it's called, I think, I think the eatery, I think the restaurant is called Genwa uh, Korean barbecue. I'm, I'm not sure, but I think that's what it was called. Um, it says one dishwasher, uh, who, um, with whom he is in conversation, with whom the reporter is in conversation, offered to come in early uh, and work longer hours, and the owners refused. The owners refused to pay him for the extra time. Instead, his only choice was to work faster. Um, in effect, uh, instead of working, uh, you know, uh, overtime he's asked to work uh, double time within the context of the time frame that he's working. And I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about what something like this means because it is, um, it is an ingredient of labor in which uh, we often find ourselves uh, where you know, we have to hustle, right? We have to hustle, we have to work quickly. Uh, and, and, and what does that, you know, what does that mean as far as um, uh, surrendering our time, you know, and getting paid for it adequately if, if of course, uh, we're concerned with, with fair pay? I wonder if you might want to share some thoughts about this. Well, yeah, I mean, I definitely think that that, that when we talk about um, having to work quickly, having to multitask, yeah, to just, just, you know, like, you know, do like several things at once, right? That is usually called unskilled labor. That is what is called unskilled labor. And so, and unskilled labor is, um, as we understand, it, is paid less than than um, than the amount of sweat that's coming out of the body, right? I mean, like the amount that the, it's 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 a uh, it's highly exploited. Um, if you're getting paid a dime less than you produce, you're being exploited. So we have to understand that exploitation is a technical term. It's not just um, a quality of life question. It yeah. means that it means that you're are you 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 are functioning in a capitalist economy, which means you produce more than you are awarded, right? More than you receive. You produce more than you receive. Um, and that's capitalism. If you are, if you receive more than you produce, then you're on the other side of capitalism. I mean, um, you know what I mean? But like, that's not, that's not, then you're not part of like kind of the workers. You're not, you're working. You might be part of some weird managerial class and like weird film in between the, the capitalists who do nothing or need All right. in order to reap the benefit from what you do. And then that, that little, managerial group of people but that's that's such an odd little yeah well, it's a category right. that yeah it's a category that we're really exploiting capital right right but 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 for the most part if you're if you, almost everyone even even like you know people that are getting paid really good salaries right they are producing more than they are awarded mm -hmm. otherwise um the whole capital system would not function right it would not function they could not function if they were being paid more than they were actually producing for somebody else so that's really important to start from right so that when we start, when we talk about exploitation uh exploitation does not necessarily mean um your life is terrible and you're, you're you're being harmed and hurt in ways that you can't manage right um that's not what exploitation means but when we talk about but there are rates of exploitation there are rates of exploitation there are um, yeah. there and they're in the and standard of living is a real thing right and so it's it's, it's the most acutely felt thing and so for the standard of living for um the for what is what is what falls in the category of unskilled labor is is horrific in this country and it's it's been horrific yeah. since the dawn of capitalism um this kind of the, the, these layers of labor um which almost always have taken on some type of um some 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 level of 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 colonial exploitation by colonialism um 
I don't mean the direct, I don't mean, it, I do mean, but not necessarily the direct, you know, mm, the colonial relationships you'll have with like, uh, you know, like authentic colonies, the way that, you know, England colonized uh, mm -hmm. India or something, right? Uh, yeah, that, but but also like, you know, when in today's world, when I say colonialism, I'm simply talking as a result of colonialism, as a result of history, as a result of war, as a result of land theft, as a result of, um, you know, these things that are that are sent, the, the the stuff of history, um, yeah. that, that have ordered and positioned people in particular um, in particular places, and so that's why you'll find um, these these kind of like groups that are kind of marginalized and and and, and othered and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, that kind of way of describing things. Um, this, these are really actually the victims of, of of colonialism. These are actually really the victims of, of history. These are actually really uh, this is the aftermath of, of 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 loss of historical struggle um, that have positioned these people in this way. You'll never find throughout the course of human history, you'll never find a group of people who are being hyperly exploited by people they lost a war to. That's just, I mean, the, you know, I mean, if you go to ancient times, you're not going to find like the Romans conquering people, and then those people the Romans just conquered exploiting the Romans. You'll never, you you, you know, you'll find that with the, the Macedonians or or the Mongolians. You're not going to find situations like that. So the, the situation is always obviously the reverse. And so when we look at the position of, of people, um, you know, Mexicanos in this country or people with Mexican descent, um, this is this is the, the result yeah. of, uh, of, of U.S. history. And we just lost Prado. So I'm going to have to send this link again. He's getting ready to say something good. I was done talking. So it's going to be a little awkward for a second here. <laughs> I ended on a pretty high note. I, I ended in like a Costanza. You know, I was very, <laughs> I was very happy. With, uh, with the point I just made and how I made it, the inflection. So uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see if uh, we can get Jose back here. Um, this is the. We're having trouble with this one. I might have to. I might have to go over to a different. Uh, I don't. Yeah, you know, I don't really think I have the Zoom available at this moment. But, oh my goodness. Okay. So hey Zoo, I see I see you're you're uh, you're doing well. You're uh, vital, making comments. <laughs> All right, All right everybody, just uh, just give me a moment. This usually just takes a minute, so don't leave. You know, 10, 15 seconds before you before you start mosing out. <laughs> That's what you need to do. Yeah, Let's see, try and do something entertaining. All right. Click the link. We're waiting for uh, Dr. Jose Prado to come back. Uh, we're discussing Capital Section 10. There he is. All right, all right. Three, two, one. All right. Okay, all right, we're back. So we're back. one of the things I wanted to uh, underscore is uh, this, this matter of exploitation that you address, because I think that um the word um uh the definition of the word and its application often uh gets uh muddled uh gets lost uh between um a sensibility and an objective condition and uh, of course uh, exploitation is uh, as it is addressed in, in in capital and as you as you introduced and in, in what you just shared a few moments ago is is much more is much more than a feeling it is um, a category of of objective conditions uh, that we might find in in various uh, scenarios various historical contexts uh, be they uh, in the contemporary uh, neoliberal or post neoliberal uh, moment, right? Where um, somebody feeds um, uh, from uh, somebody else's labor, right? Uh, or in the uh, uh, colonial condition, right? Where uh, one nation and its um, uh, economy is sustained by uh, the exploitation of another uh, sector, another society uh, as, 
as of course has historically been the case, say between Spain and uh, America or the various countries in America, um, and has historically been the case, uh, frankly, with uh, 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 Britain and um, and Ireland, for instance, right? Uh, that, that these are exploitative uh, relationships, right? Uh, and so uh, often, uh, often I hear students uh, talk about exploitation as um, the anxiety or the frustration that they experience at work. And certainly, uh, as I think you mentioned, uh, objective conditions certainly generate uh, frustration. Objective conditions certainly generate uh, anxiety. Uh, but that anxiety, uh, stemmed as it is in exploitation, is not in and of itself the exploitation. Right? The exploitation is the extraction of time, the extraction of labor, the extraction of blood uh, from uh, from the worker who is being exploited. Uh, let's get into the second. Uh, let's get into the second quote to begin to illustrate this discussion, and then towards uh, maybe the, the the second third of the of of our talk, uh, we can get into uh, the discussion of you know dead labor and 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 you know capitalism as vampiric, you know as we were talking about before we started the show uh, this morning. Uh, and this particular worker talking to the reporter says he has no choice but to surrender to the conditions of uh, double time as opposed to overtime, right? Uh, he has no choice. And of course he has no choice because he has two elderly parents, a wife who needs expensive cancer treatment and children to raise. On top of this, and this is where the discussion begins to uh, link us to the, uh, the context of our show, which is, you know, uh, Chicano and Chicano centric, Mexican and uh, Mexican centric as it were, right? Um, is that he can't speak English. So there are historical conditions, uh, geographic conditions, economic and quote unquote international global conditions, right? That contextualize this worker's existence and encapsulate him, uh, contain him within, within this uh, system of exploitation. I wonder, um, what you're thinking uh, might be about this, particularly as far as, as, as particular as far as his uh, containment, both by the English language and um, uh, by illness. Over the years, I've I've known people who sold cars, and one of the one of the the, the common themes I always hear is that you know when they're successful at it you know because like when you sell cars you can be fired for the next i sold cars for like two months and then one month i was doing good and the next month i wasn't i got fired so the, you, you, you freaking out there right but one of the common things i really heard of from people who were good at it like and consistently good at it uh was that you know you will um be encouraged by your boss right um to buy things for yourself clothes, new car, new this, new that. And you'll be pressured. If you don't do this, you might be let go, even if you are selling well. And the reason they want you to do that is they want you to need that job, right? And if you think about like a lot uh, of people are really good at selling cars, they tend to be around the mid twenties, maybe early thirties. Um, they are, they talk fast. They're usually men. They're usually people with no bills, you know. Um, you know, if they do have kids, they're deadbeat dads. I mean, like, they're pretty yeah, yeah. What, they, what they want to make sure is that these people are desperate and need this job. You know what I'm saying? And you hear that in the mm -hmm. corporate world. There's always this, this, this kind of like this thing about like, you know, if you if they see that you have a kid, if they see that you have a family, some kids, you know, it's more likely to da 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 da. da. You know, what I mean, all this kind of stuff like that. Just you know, you give the impression that you need this job, right? Um, this concept of being overqualified, the idea that you don't need this job, you could leave this job, right? Um, so oftentimes we see like throughout the entire workforce, this this position, this this uh, created this this artificial need created for the job, the art artificial dependence on the job has to be established in order for you to work here, right? And it's really explicit with the car industry. Um, but you see it in the corporate level as well. You see mm -hmm. you 
these these different levels of artificial necessity um, being um, being presented as uh, as as a hiring plus, right? This okay. I'm going to give you this job because I know that you're desperate, or there's a or there's an aspect of you that 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 if you lose this, your 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 lifestyle is going to crumble, right? Your life, as you know, it will be destroyed. Well, that's artificially created. Um, society has created, history has created a group of people that are extremely dependent upon um, uh, 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 the, 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 these these jobs, right? So there's a whole lev layer of that, and these are like the, the, a world of of of, of, um, of proletariat that are that are um, more desperate than the general proletariat, more, um, and they and they receive desperation wages, okay? And so there's there's an entire like, and and that is essentially. For the most part, I mean that is the bulk of what is called essential labor uh, in this in this period of COVID, and uh, that's a really kind of interesting phenomenon. When we when we see in the midst of crisis, there's a there's a group of workers, and they're primarily in that kind of range, right? And there's other there's other aspects too, but but a lot of people in the, in, the, in that kind of range called essential workers. What does this mean? To, what is essential labor? I mean, this, this is the, what is this what is this COVID nineteen revealing to us? I mean, especially in the early days. Uh, of what is actually essential, what is actually necessary, what what would actually happen uh, if these jobs were to leave? Well, these these jobs were to leave society as we understand it would shut down, right? Whereas jobs that are paid way more uh, are not considered uh, essential, right? So that's kind of um, that's kind of uh, yeah, you know, that 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 that, you know, that that I mean, I just want to say that 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 um, that we find that in 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 these in these categories, um. These are like this is this is this is, this is the kind of low wage, and as we say again, um, quote unquote, unskilled labor, and yet it is the most necess it is the most necessary uh, labor for society to function. Like without this, yeah. labor, there's like there's there's it's almost like a building. Like there's there's floors of labor that would not be able, that would crumble to the ground without this labor as the bedrock. There's uh, uh, debt that precedes employment. And then debt that uh, follows employment, and then that debt becomes the uh, the motor. Uh, that debt becomes uh, the engine. That debt becomes uh, that element uh, within us that compels us to, uh, you know, uh, aguantar is the word that's coming to my mind in Spanish, right? Uh, is the is 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 the reason. You know uh, that uh, folks such as this particular worker endures what he endures. You know, recently I came across a post on Facebook of a colleague uh, whose work I uh, admire uh, very, very much. She's doing great work, uh, and uh, one of the things that she mentions is that uh, she's in debt. You know, and she's a very well respected very highly regarded uh, uh, intellectual in, uh, in Chicano and Chicano uh, academic circles. And um, one would think, right, one would think that um, uh, that regard, that appreciation, that, that importance of one's intellectual work would uh, somehow liberate one in today's world, one would imagine, uh, uh, would be liberated from uh, this, you know, the the anxiety and 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 the need to produce, 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 you know, uh, on account of debt. So uh, anyway, I wonder. Well, there's a whole series of of of, of questions that I have uh, as far as that kind of thinking goes, or that kind of experience, or that kind of exploitation goes. But before we go into that, I'd like to uh, just share this, uh, one of these quotes here, is I think this is, uh, this is a good bridge to uh, begin discussion about dead labor, uh, and really uh, dead labor as not just a, a metaphorical um, uh, a term, but perhaps nearing, uh, you know, the real and the real significance of the word dead in the term dead labor it says this particular uh, work was shared with the reporter that the acid that is used to clean the metal grills causes allergies. Well, 
we're about to hear the conditions of uh, of uh, of the workers in, uh, in the restaurant industry here in Los Angeles, but uh, don't want us to hear it. So we're gonna send out that uh, that link again to uh, to, to Dr. Prado. Hopefully, get him back on here. Don't leave. Don't leave. It usually, it takes about thirty seconds. Um, I need to start thinking of uh, of entertaining things I can do in, in between uh, <laughs> in between getting him back. Uh, um, man, all right. Uh, let's see. Looking at uh, what Zen's saying here, he says uh, the debtor credit relation, which is at the heart of this book, sharpens the mechanisms of exploitation and domination. Uh, there's no distinction between workers and employed and consumers, producers, workers, non working populations between those welfare recipients. They are all debtors, guilty and responsible in the eyes of capital, which is universal, great, the universal creditor. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, that's a great, uh, it's a great quote. We'll get into it later. Here we go. All right. So, anyway, one of the uh, I, I don't know where I was. I don't know where I I, I was you lost. Said the acid, the acid burns, and then and then. Yes, yes, yes. So, so the reporter is informed that workers in this particular restaurant uh, work with acids uh, that are used to kill to clean the metal metal grills, uh, you know, that are used to prepare the food that uh, one consumes. <laughs> And these acids uh, cause allergies, damage hands, uh, damage lungs, damage the respiratory tract, track, right? One dishwasher even got some of this acid, uh, the report says. One uh, dishwasher got some of this acid in his eyes and became blind. I wonder, I wonder now how we can begin to talk about dead labor, right? Um, um, and make make the jump from a discussion of uh, the damage to the body, right, to the uh, uh, containment of labor in technology, right? So to talk about dead labor uh, empirically, you know, uh, as far as the word dead is concerned, uh, you know, keeping as true to the word, uh, true to the definition of the word dead as possible, and then begin to talk about dead labor in the metaphoric sense, right? In as far as the technologies of, of, of employment are concerned. Uh, do you want to address that? Well, I mean, like, again, we're talking now about the conditions of, of, of labor, and we're talking about essentially, um, I mean, this concept of dead labor, I mean, it's kind of a poetic kind of rhetorical flourish, but when we see, um, when we see uh, what, um, you know, kind of the viciousness of, uh, of capital has really been laid bare uh, in this moment, that people are being put into conditions where, um, where, you know, their health is is, is very secondary yeah. to, to, to to making a profit. So I mean, you see people, you know, cleaning with acid, and you see people doing things that you know, like they're 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 um, again, we're talking about the conditions here. I mean, but if you look at um, so much of of, of uh, labor law in this country, and who's exempt from it, and and who yeah. doesn't, you know, who can be exploited, who can not only be exploited but be be, be worked in 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 horrible conditions. I mean. It, it obviously, you know, speaks to the history of this country. I mean, like, and and, and not the not the not the distant one either. I mean, you look at uh, some of the the the, the struggles of uh, of, um, of the farm of the farm worker movement. I mean, you know, to not to not be sprayed with pesticide and DDT. Um, that's that's within you know my lifetime, and that's why I'm mean, probably like that was still going into the eighties, nineties. I mean, so um, that yeah, they, they don't they, they the the people that that that, that own things and they don't give a damn about uh, about. Um, Whose life they endanger. I mean, especially if the people whose lives are endangered are are kind of like specified as a group of people who um, that's just the way it is. You know, that's the way it is in this country. You know, those those, those people do the job, and uh, and they do that and they do that job. You know, um, so that we can do this other job. You know, and uh, and that's you know, and if uh, and uh, if they knew better, they do better, right? That kind of attitude that that people have in this country towards a. Uh, Towards me, kind of, towards, there, towards there's brown people in general. I mean, you know, they're seen as kind of the mule of the economy. You know what? 
there's there's the potential to miss the distinction. Uh, I mean, both both uh, applications of the word, I think, or, or the term, I think, are important. You know, dead labor as something real, immediate, and visible, and then a dead labor as something metaphoric, abstract, uh, historical, right? And and contextualized within the development of uh, labor technologies uh, throughout uh, throughout history, and so. Um, I'm, I also want to talk about this, the second aspect, you know, uh, that dead labor is. And I'm thinking about the ways in which uh, technology uh, today, uh, in fact, throughout history, of course, uh, throughout, the, throughout the history of capitalism, how technology has been employed to contain uh, the value uh, of workers so that we can have uh, production without workers and so that the machinery the technology of capitalism is itself dead labor right it is it is the extraction of labor power the containment of labor power right uh, the containment of labor minus the human beings if you will right such that the machinery its gears uh, its movement uh, uh, generates, you know uh, the various commodities uh, that we that we consume and and put to use in society. Um, any mention about that? Uh, any discussion? Well, about when, you, when you read the chapter, when he talks about that, when he, when he actually says uh, capital is dead labor, he says before that he says all events uh, uh, that occur in a less than a, a natural day, but by how much? He says the necessity limit over the working day. The capitalist he's only capital personified. His soul is of capital, but capital has one single life impulse, a tendency to create value and surplus value, make a constant factor of the means of production to absorb the greatest possible amount of surplus labor. Capital is dead labor that vampire like only lives by sucking living labor and the, the and lives the more the more labor it sucks. The time during which the labor works is the time during the capitalist consumes the labor power he has purchased of him. So what he's saying is that like when he, when he says capital is dead labor, what he means is the moment that you're working, you're going to receive those wages is being propelled by this thing that's already been set in motion, right? So we're talking about, when we talk about like, um, you know, he used the term primitive, but let's just say early accumulation, right? Uh, that, that period of initial accumulation, that's one thing, right? That occurs at a different point in time. But after you get past the initial accumulation, you're now the ball is now rolling, right? Yeah. And as it rolls, it continues to roll. So like, the, you, let's say you're like, let's say the hill is like 50 feet steep, right? By the time you're at, at, at foot 35, you're getting paid off the wage. Um, and you, I'll, I'll kill suddenly. But by, by the time you get to foot 35, you're being paid from the wages of foot 22, right? So that the, the wages you receive for, for the 35th foot, uh, foot you roll is actually the 22nd, is the, is the dead labor from the 22nd from, you know, feet 22. So that is kind of what is meant by that. Um, the, the capital is dead labor is meant that that um, that you're being paid from this thing that you did long ago, um, and and not just you, but a whole world of laborers um, that labored uh, in the past. And so, like that's kind of that that's kind of what Marx meant um, by capital being dead labor. It's 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 the work that has already been put in um, that, it, that that kind of feeds and necessitates its further its own further exploitation. So when he talks about um, the purpose of the capitalist, the purpose of the capitalist there is to absorb your surplus labor. Now, what is your surplus labor? Your surplus labor is what goes above and beyond, uh, you know, the labor you do in order to survive. Um, so that, that, that's what's meant by that. So as I was saying, uh, uh, Jose, it was that um, what's meant by this is like, let's say if you imagine a hill and let's say the hill is 50 foot steep. Um, yeah, yeah. By the time you get to foot 35, you're actually getting paid from foot 22nd. From the, from the 22nd, so forth, forth, forth. Yeah. whatever the, whatever that number is, that depends upon the rate of your exploitation. Um, there's no exact math for that because um, because this this isn't sorted by a computer. I mean, I I, I think it's in capital wages. It's in it's in um, wages, labor, and something. I don't know. It's in that one. It's in that one where it's got three words in it. Um, but he talks about. Um, some people refuting what he's saying because they're saying because because he finds because people like identify uneven wages. Well, how can this be an exact science if that guy over there is getting paid this much and that one's getting paid this much? 
Well, I mean, that's between the capitalist and the laborer. I mean, like the, the deal that is struck, right? The, um, it, the, the deal will never be 100%. Like you will receive 100% of the wages for what you produce. That will never happen because that wouldn't be capital. But, um, but the rate of exploitation, that varies. It varies. Yeah. And it varies yeah. on, the, on a human level. It varies, you know, in the ability to negotiate when you're once you're hired in. I mean, we see that. I mean, we see that all throughout. We see that all through the workforce when people talk about the wage with the the, the wage scale, right? Um, between you know men and women, right? And and you, you see that it, it's it plays out racially, but within each racial with within each demographic designation, the women are always getting paid less, right? Well, that has a lot that that has a lot to do with again this thing we're talking about. Of with um with with the way labor is you know when you perceive someone like aha I can exploit them more, but again that obviously shows that there are rates of exploitation that go on. I mean, the the men that are working there are also being exploited. I mean, including the white men. I mean, everyone's being exploited under capitalism. Yeah, yeah. That's what capitalism is. But the rates of exploitation vary. Um, but that does not mean that um the worker simply because rates of exploitation vary is not all is not engaged in the dynamic process of exploitation. Yeah, um, there's the so, but even like even let's say let's let's take those factors out. Let's take those factors out. Let's just take the, take the factor of just like two individuals, similar class background, similar um, ethnic demographic, uh, the same ethnic demographic, same gender, same same all 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 these things, right? Um, one may just negotiate better than the other um, when, when they get hired. That does not mean that capitalism doesn't exist. That does not mean they're not both both being exploited. That does not exist outside the bounds of exploitation yeah well they are certainly historical conditions that uh bear on the uh the rates of exploitation and uh these historical conditions are determined uh, dialectically right such that the um you know uh, however organized labor is in relation Man, every time every time he gets a good a good uh <laughs> good a good uh good ladder there, he it, it uh, seems to seems to be the way. All right, um, we're gonna get this. We're gonna get the. We're gonna get this. We're gonna get this right. This is gonna. This is uh. We're gonna do this. With any with any amount of clicks necessary. Um. Yeah. So again, when we're talking about the labor, we're talking about a group of people that, uh, you know, we're talking about everyone. Oh, here we go. I guess I actually have no tell saying. So he's back. <laughs> One, two, three. Wait, wait, wait. All right, there we go. All right. Hey, Matt. I think we need um, a new technology. <laughs> I, think, I think I think we're trying to shift it over to Zoom. But the thing about the Zoom is that um, is that uh, that's shared, and I, I, it's easier for me to do it like at night as a, during the day. I don't know what classes are going on. Um, so, but I, I, I'll talk to Margaret about reserving, uh, Monday at, uh, 10 a.m. Um, for, for, for these. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, or we can, you know, we can figure something out offline, but anyway, get, getting back to getting yeah. back to the discussion. Um, there are historical conditions that determine the rate of exploitation. Right, and these historical conditions, of course, are uh, dialectically determined. Right, such that uh, the tensions, the, the negotiations, the battles, and the confrontations that take place between uh, a labor and capital uh, bear on the uh, bear on uh, the uh, the extent of of uh, in the, as far as labor is concerned the extent of remuneration benefits and a safety that that uh, workers can uh, secure and of course the opposite is the case uh, if if capital is victorious in those confrontations right they can extract more security from labor etc uh, and so this gives us an opportunity to talk about two things within this context of of labor as far as capital is concerned, uh, capital has uh, two costs. The first cost is, is constant, and the second cost is variable. Variable costs, or rather variable capital, right, to use the language of the book, is 
is that set of costs, that set of investments that um, uh, cannot be entirely determined and established, controlled and monopolized by capital. So it gives us an opportunity to talk about these tensions that we were talking about uh, just a few moments ago. Um, but then there's there are these constant costs and constant costs represent the uh, capacity uh, to control, monopolize, determine, and set the parameters of time, space, right, within within uh, the uh, within the factory or on the factory floor, for instance, right? Yeah. And there is where we might find there is where we might find uh, dead labor as well. Well, there, I, 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 well, sorry, I'm sorry. There is where we might find dead labor. There is where the technology uh, is is the, the various technologies, and I'm not just talking about the metal work, I'm not just talking about the gears and the shafts and the, ch and the cylinders and the channels uh, through which labor power is channeled, right? But I'm also talking about the uh, infrastructure uh, that facilitates the exploitation of, of, of labor. And so, and so, surplus value right is is to be determined is to be found uh within the variety of of, of spaces where it can be uh, uh, uh localized surplus value is to be is to be found there right uh that's a great place to start within the context of dead labor within the context of technology uh your thoughts well, the labor power the labor power meets the machine, and therefore the the labor is imbued into the commodity, and yeah. that's that that that's the, the that's the the profit that's the rate of that's the rate of return that's the et cetera et cetera et cetera. But what I really when I start talking when I start talking about expanding, uh, what is dead labor? What is what is constant? What is constant capital? Yeah. The thing that goes to my mind, the most pressing issue is not necessarily the machines and the technology and the gears and all that stuff like that, because that is all true. I mean, and, and that is very important to yeah. understand. But the thing that, that the thing that always draws my, you know, there, there goes that technology again. The thing that always uh, drives uh, drives my connection, uh, my interest is um, is fact that uh, you know we're talking about constant capital part of that constant capital is the good earth you know the planet we live on so we can be talking about uh you know something that marx would, wouldn't would have exactly been aware of and and and, and understandably so um you know when we're talking about we're talking about dead labor we can talk about dead labor on a dead planet i mean because you know the fact of the matter is when we think of this constant capital is also the planet we live on it's also the extraction it's also the earth it's also pulling minerals out of the ground and um, and that process and that practice that we've been involved in for the past couple hundred years uh, is 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 you know, potentially going to kill everything off. I mean, prevent life on the planet, on Earth. So what I was saying was that um, the, to me, the one of the most pressing things when we talk about these things um, is 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 everything you've mentioned, but also that part of constant capital is is the good Earth, is is the planet itself, is is the ground, is the sea, is the is a place from which natural resources are extracted, right? So it's it's the machines of extraction, but it's also um, uh, nature. It's also what's called nature. It's also the world, right? It's also part of that dominion over the world is also part of that constant capital, right? And that um, we could be end up talking about dead labor on a dead planet. I mean, if if, if we if we continue on these process with the in, in the in the style and manner in which we do, um, and that's something that Marx didn't necessarily touch on that much because you know obviously there was not the you know the the, the the scientific reporting really wasn't on really wasn't there about like wait a minute you know this uh this industrial form of, of life <clears throat> whether conducted by socialists or capitalists uh will yeah. destroy the earth um or will destroy the the the, the possibility will preclude the possibility of human life on earth yeah. Um, yeah if you continue in this manner um and that's not something he could have foreseen or, or foreshadowed or, or, or whatever so there's, there's no reason for him to talk about it but um within the, within the realm of constant capital is like natural resources so um you know <laughs> drilling into the earth uh and so yeah. that uh, that that is not limitless that is not a bottomless pit that is not just a uh that is not a well that will uh that will ever that will never run dry yeah hey hey matt uh we're uh, uh the conversation has gone 
gone um, well however interrupted it's been it's it's it's, it's gone quickly <laughs> um let's let's see if we can let's get uh let's let's uh respond to uh to some folks here uh, uh first off i want to thank uh, various folks who have been posting daniel mejia um uh, thank you for joining us of course uh, as you might have figured out by now we're talking about uh, uh capital uh, we're reading chapter 10 did we introduce the did we introduce i forget if we introduced chapter 10 uh at the outset of our talk but that's what we're talking about uh Capital. In this case, we're talking. We, you know, we're going through the whole book, and at this point, we're reading chapter ten and discussing it. Jesus, uh, thank you uh, for joining us. Garay, San, uh, always with us. Thank you so much, San and and, and Garay and Jesus. I recognize the name now. Uh, these these um, these last few episodes. Dust, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, make sure to check out Dust's uh, show. He also does uh, a show somewhat. Uh, along uh, the lines of the work that you and I are doing, Matt. Um, I forget the, uh, the <laughs> please forgive me, Dust, but uh, you can post it here uh, if you'd like. You're welcome to do so uh, to uh, let folks know about the conversation that you and, and that young uh, young man over in Australia, I believe, uh, you're in conversation with as far as, uh, as, far as the topics of, of uh, socialism uh, and the uh, various internationals that have taken place. Uh, and um, anyway, um, oh, Matt, I wanted to uh, mention something. Uh, our show is not the only one. Um, of course, you know, people have been talking and, and reading and, and addressing Capital uh, ever since it was first published uh, some 150 years ago or so. Um, and so uh, we join that trajectory of, uh, of conversation. Um, and, um, as it turns out, you know, as, as I, uh, spend some time online and, and check things out, I've discovered, I've discovered that there's a show, uh, in Mexico city. Um, uh, the folks, uh, Para Leer en Libertad also have, um, a show, I think, uh, uh, Para Comprender, Para Comprender Valor. O te vale, I think is <laughs> is the title of the show. So they're they're looking at the theory of value over there in Mexico City. Uh, the folks over with Paco Taibo and uh, Para Leer en Libertad, and then also the folks in also uh, there are folks in San Diego. Uh, the Raza, Association of Raza Educators in San Diego is also um, uh, generating. Uh, a show something uh, along the lines of the work that we're doing. So I'm glad that we are a part of something. I'm glad to have been a part uh, with you, Matt, of this historical, uh, uh, you know, attention to history this way and uh, interested and excited to know that um, there's a community uh, uh, developing uh, around this. Um, um, any thoughts that you might uh, want to share about, about this, Matt? You know, I, I welcome, uh, I welcome the, uh, I'm, I'm happy people are doing it. And, yeah. you know, like, uh, you know, there's an aspect of me that's very competitive. So, you know, oft imitated, never duplicated, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's good. That's good. You know, the whole point is to have influence. The whole point, the whole point is that people uh, start engaging this work and, you know, and, and it's very, it's a, it's a, it's a good thing. It's a beautiful thing that, um, that people are, are really trying to, to, to look at the, the, the world uh, through a materialist lens. I mean, ultimately the, the, the reality is that like, you know, as we try to look at the world around us and try to advocate for something better or different. Yeah. Um, the way I look view myself is very much, you know, I don't, I don't even know if I call myself a Marxist that often. I, I think of myself as a, cause that, that, that ties me to the, 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 the formulations and conclusions of one person. Right. That's so I would, you know, I would, yeah, so I definitely read Marx, but like, it's not kind of like, but, but it's not, I, I would consider myself a historical materialist. Right. Yeah. And, and, um, and I'm a historical materialist, so that means that I can turn my whenever whatever I choose to look at, I look at it through the lens of historical materialism, yeah. right? And so the problem with so much of U.S. Marxism is the insistence that historical materialist lens should only be turned on these certain topics, right? And if you do something outside of that, it's 
revisionist or it's 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 uh, you know some type of it's petty bourgeois ethnic nationalism blah 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 mm -hmm. right it, it, it really you know the united states is an incredibly racist chauvinist country um that views certain histories not worth uh turning a lens to just because that's true does not mean that the lens that should not be turned shouldn't be historical materialist an historical materialist lens just means like you look at what happened and you ask why it happened yeah. right you don't you don't essentialize things you don't look at things through the, the the vantage point of um of these easy answers uh which is very which are very popular today in 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 in, in, um, in you know intellectual circles or mm -hmm. uh, pseudo intellectual circles that make up the so-called intelligentsia uh that come out of the wide majority i don't mean everybody but the wide majority of the academy these days uh, people just like is just saying things that make no sense and it's very just metaphysical kind of stuff um the kind of the metaphysics that kind of dominate and have always kind of dominated yes. um, the intelligentsia um because the intelligentsia they're either they're either not um they're either too lazy uh to to, to do the work of historical materialism or they are opportunistically tied um to come to the conclusions um that are suitable to capital maybe not desired but suitable you know it's it's a it's a it's an opposition that 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 capital can deal with you know um because it's just it's just it's just kind of a petty talking shit kind of just you know whatever type of opposition that does not actually allow for material struggle to arise out of it yeah and they're comfortable with that kind of thing yeah yeah hey um uh matt yeah. we're at the we're at the final minute um also, uh, my sincere apologies, folks. I haven't been had a chance to uh, respond to various people. Uh, uh, you know, as, as I said, as, as a, the excuse that I made uh, is that I'm, but it's true, I promise, it's true. I'm getting uh, things ready for the semester. It's about to start. I start, you know, instruction next week, however modified it is. And so there's a lot of work uh, as far as you know getting that off the ground. So I, uh, anytime I'm at my computer writing, it has you know it's all linked with, within that within that context. So I apologize, um, and uh, having having uh, laid bare my heart and apologize, uh, Matt, won't you lay bare your poet your poetic heart? Won't you share some poetry um, to uh, close? Uh, today's discussion. All right. So by the end of the next week, I'll have a complete version of this poem. So the way I write is an act is an, an act structure. Wow. So I'm going to do Act One and Act Two of this poem, Camelot. And by next week, I'm doing this to myself so that it forces me to finish this thing. What is the title? Camelot. Camelot. Okay. So I'll have I'll have the, the 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 Act Three of Camelot prepared by next week. Okay. This is a Molotov tossed towards Camelot. This is Paradise One. The rise of the sixth son, the smith that is legend, the sense of direction when he can't trust your senses materially, historic and dialectic, mysterious until it isn't, it is written. The now past, present, and future generations count seven. This is that this and that shit. They don't knock it till you try it. Today's hypothesis, tomorrow's science, that which remains the same, state of constant change, a fit of rage, and jilted state, and a gilded age, sparked the lights of flame in these decades, made days of the rich sound ridiculous, that post-industrial proletariat, spitting back through knowledge, eat the rich. History will absolve us. The city was built against us. Always was. Even now, a city shoots up, the law crashes down from the hanging courts, the peerless jury, the sitting judge. The city is out for blood. Look right, look left. Bands of armed men pledged eternal orders to one another, answer only to the call of death. In fire and memory, the city's walls rebel. Tell tales of a time when the people arose, though long ago and somewhere else. Pride is the compromise of public life struck by those who serve in the killers of time. The devourers of light, parasites, the city rides by night, runs off the sweat of the backs of those who work at laying their egg brick, the walls them off and off to stuff the pockets of those who work them. The city is a field. Labor is the crop. As one building crumbles under the scrapes of sky, planners call it beautification and blight. Ink bleeds a cartography of hypocrisy and lies as every next day's headline reads a poor mother's nightmare and a rich man's dream. The tale of all too many cities is in a shame. There was no other way. After careful consideration and internal investigation, the city finds no fault within itself. Tragic. Inevitable, regrettable, but justifiable. It's another day, another slain, another shot in the back of the hands of death squads. The city is awash with tears, the tail to die on your feet by parable, by any means, trajectory of a Molotov tossed towards the break of dawn by prayer and proverb tonight, Camelot burns. And that's all you have for now. <laughs> I'll come with you next week with the final. The final, right. the final. Great, great. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, 
if I say it's a great poem, uh, I don't address its um, its incisive critique. I don't address its critique of deplorable conditions. You know, uh, um, it's a well-received poem for me. I'm sure everybody else that hears it receives it very well, and and it's resonant uh, and very useful, very important. And uh, I'm privileged to uh, be in conversation with you, Matt, and and help you know uh, diversify <laughs> uh, the curriculum, the the, the poetic uh, curriculum. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And we'll talk about it next week. <laughs> Chingon. <laughs>